Okay. Welcome to We The People Live. I'm Josh Zepps. Uh, my apologies that last week we were going to have Artie Lang on the show, and poor Artie was taken ill, so he was replaced by the very fantastic and entertaining Michael Moynihan of Vice. Uh, I will be talking to Artie shortly, probably next week, but today, someone better than either of them, the one and only Gad Sad. Evolutionary, evolutionary behavioral scientist at the John Molson School of Business in Montreal, in Canada. Uh, Gad also has a blog at Psychology Today entitled Homo Consumericus. I never knew how to pronounce that, Gad. How am I supposed to say it? I would, I would say it Consumericus, but it doesn't matter. But that's because you're a, an academic wonk who says things correctly. <laughs> exactly Whereas right. I'm a heathen Australian who doesn't know things. <laughs> um, we are talking in a week where we've just had a vice presidential debate last night. We've got the next uh, presidential debate coming up. Uh, let's just spitball for a moment about where the political scene is is at. It, where, where is your head at with regarding the Trump phenomenon? Uh, so, you know, I, my position is this. I think I when I when I watch people on my Facebook page chatting about this, uh, it's either Trump is going to be the savior of the, of the United States or he is the, you know, he's Hitler. He's the next Hitler. And of course, anybody with a brain who sort of is able to navigate through nuance knows that somewhere between those two extremes lies the correct position. So my, my view is this, and I'm going to take a very academic view because I think it's, it's actually the correct one. Depending on which decision rule you use, and I'll explain in a second what I mean, then Trump either looks attractive or not. So, for example, if we use a decision rule that says, let's look at all of the attributes that define these candidates and choose the one that scores the highest totally as a total package, then an argument can certainly be made that maybe Hillary Clinton is the one that you know people should be looking to as the next president. On the other hand, if you use something called the lexicographic rule, which is basically look at your most important attribute and choose the one that scores better only on that attribute. So let's suppose I only care about immigration issues because ultimately for me, this is an existential problem uh, that our great grandchildren are going to have to deal with. Well, then an argument could be made that Donald Trump has a better handle specifically on only that attribute. So I don't think it's clear that Trump is Hitler and Hillary Clinton is wonderful. I think it really depends on which type of heuristic you use to make it, to make the choice. If you use that latter heuristic, then couldn't does it work in reverse as well? In other words, uh, in, in addition to there being people who can say, I'm only going to focus on this one issue because it's the most important issue to me and he's the best on this issue. Could you not also say, I'm only going to focus on this issue because it's the greatest liability for me? For example, having someone who doesn't have experience in foreign policy, maybe that's your, you know, your concern. And therefore, you rule them, you rule them out of question right out of the gate. Absolutely. You so, know? I mean, the, I mean, the, the, the greater point of what we're talking about is that contrary to sort of the classical economic model, which basically says there is one decisional rule that we should use if we're trying to maximize our utility, the example that you've given, in addition to the two that I have, shows that there is a panoply of decision rules that can lead us, even within the same individual, depending on which rule I use, I can either choose car A or car B, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. So that's really where the nuance comes in. And so I, I really find it frustrating when I see some of my academic friends all of whom are in complete herd agreement that only someone who is lobotomized, irrational, a racist could ever consider Trump. And I think that that's frankly laughable. What if the what if the reason why the person is supporting Trump is more of a gut feeling than a rational thought? Because I think part of the problem that tr that people who oppose Trump have with understanding Trump voters, and I partly even put myself in this in this category because I find them sometimes difficult to to communicate with the real Trumpers. You know, not not the people who are like, oh, I'm going to vote for him on a lark because I'm sick and tired of social justice warriors and I want to see Hillary's face the day that she loses. But someone who really believes that, that who's really drunk the Kool Aid that they believe that he's going to make America great again. Um, I feel like. Trump isn't a collection of facts or opinions or, uh, or or policies, and he's not even a specific, nor is he a specific policy like his immigration policy. What he is is a vibe. What he is is a general worldview. What he is is like someone who gets something fundamental that hits them in a place that is sub-cerebral, that is like the, the little lizard bit of your brain at the top of your brain stem, where it's like, yes, this is a person who's speaking a language that I finally understand, and I've spent the past few decades listening to politicians talk in such a phony way, always spouting the same bullshit, you know, always in this kind of cozy agreement between Wall Street and Washington, D.C., and here's a guy who's slinging it from the hip, and who... and so. 
it's almost immaterial what he says. Right. It's almost immaterial how much he lies. What it is, is it's, it's connecting with us, I think, in a different place other than our brain. And I wonder what you think as sort of a scientist of, a, of behavioral economics about that. I mean, certainly that's feasible. But, to, I mean, gut feelings, though, ultimately don't exist in this magical place. As you correctly said, they are, if you like, little slices of environmental input that we are processing, albeit at an unconscious or, or subconscious level, right? So, for example, if I go to a party and I meet Josh and I decide, you know, this guy gave me the creeps. I don't necessarily know. Happens quite frequently in my life, yeah. <laughs> this was a complete hypothetical. It was another Josh. Another oh, he just Josh. happened to be called Josh. Exactly. Thanks, Gad. Uh, well, but... I once met an asshole called Gad. Coincidence. <laughs> Who happened to be extremely good looking and accomplished, but fine. Uh, but anyway, so, so let's suppose I meet this gentleman and he gives me the creeps. The reality is that that feeling that I have, which we're now calling gut rather than rational or higher order, really does stem from my having picked up a certain set of cues that allow me to arrive to that judgment. The only thing that makes it gut is that it's not exactly accessible to me what those cues are. So in that sense, I might agree with what you're saying. There's something that people are responding to, and we could debate and discuss what that might be. But let me mention another slight thing, if I may. Uh, what Trump also does, I mean, in, in science, we, we often talk about, so the original term that, that's probably now become a cliche, paradigm shift, right? It comes from Thomas Kuhn, who was a philosopher of science, who basically said, look, big scientific breakthroughs come when somebody trashes the old paradigm and starts with a new paradigm shift, right? You've got to, you've got to kill the old paradigm. And so you really need some catalyst of change to be able to. And so I think whether we agree that he's the right guy to do this or not, Trump represents that cataclysmic change, that paradigm shift in the political arena, precisely because of the reasons that you said. He's not the establishment. He is funding himself. And there is a romantic appeal to this. I no longer want the same career politicians to be telling me the same bullshit. I'm speaking now, not as God, as, as a yeah. president, right? And so there might be an element of that. He represents a discontinuous radical change. I remember Thomas Kuhn from my philosophy of science days at the University of, of, of Sydney. What, I, what strikes me as different in the political or sociological sphere from the scientific sphere is that there are, there are huge liabilities to a massive paradigm shift in the political sphere. Right? You, I think you need to reach a threshold of belief that everything is sufficiently rotten Right. to contemplate an overturning of the established order. Yeah. And, and yeah. this is what's weird about Trump in the conservative movement, because the conservative instinct is supposed to be, let's hold on to what's good about the past. You know, conservatives cherish the founding fathers and the military and stability and America's hegemony and the special. They don't tend to be as comfortable with the rapid change that, that, that they see with, you know, trans issues and all these things that they regard as being eroding the old order. The weird thing for me about Trump and about what he's doing to American conservatism, and it's not just here, it's in the UK with Brexit, it's in Australia with the rise of the One Nation Party, which is a similar anti-immigration party that just won four Senate seats in a recent election, is a kind of overturning of that cautiousness that remains within the same paradigm and a leaping into the unknown which strikes me at least as being very foolhardy. Now, people who support that probably say, well, of course it's foolhardy to use EPS because you're a privileged white male, so the status quo seems pretty good. <laughs> um, but, you know, there are all sorts of other people who would like things to change. But it's weird to me that, that one, one cohort of people who want things to change very much are radical leftists and social justice warriors, and another cohort of people who want things to change very much are the alt-right and Trumpisters. And the rest of us are here flailing around in the middle. Do you, know, do you know how much credit we should give to our instinct not to have a paradigm shift? <laughs> right. Well, there's, there's a lot of stuff to do. <laughs> yeah. By the way, before I, is, is, is the, is, if you release this eventually as an audit, as a visual, is the Yeah, it does look, look a bit bad. Can you close the yeah, blind me, or something okay, me, or just uh, twist yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Me, give me a second. Yeah, cool. Is this better? Yes, heaps oh, better. Good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, again, I think it's a question of 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 nuanced thinking. Uh, you know, the the Republicans 
in my view. And again, I, I love I love to have these conversations because I could always re- I could always retort with I'm Canadian, so I don't have a dog in this fight. And so <laughs> me too. And yeah, so, I'm exactly. Not so, Australian. We're so, basically the same. Exactly. Country. Nobody can You're attack us. Uh, yeah. right. uh, so so in my view, I can't understand how Republicans, as a strategist, can can care so much about issues that it seems to me in today's sort of zeitgeist they should walk away from. So re- caring about what people do in the privacy of their bedrooms seems to be in the long run a losing political position. And so get over this kind of uh, antiquated, uh, old fashioned, I wanna be in your bedroom as the government sort of mentality. Uh, so that I don't understand. And, and here's where nuance can come in. On the other hand, the left folks, as I look at them, uh, are so dogmatic about certain positions, for example, never uttering the word Islam as Hillary never does, or as Barack Obama never does, all the cultural relativist bullshit, all the postmodernist stuff, all the politically correct speak, that it it baffles me that people who are otherwise sophisticated, accomplished people could be so parasitized that they can no longer see reality uh, as clearly as the existence of gravity. So I wish there were a party or a politician who somehow can strike the right notes between these two extremes. Uh, Maybe I need to suddenly be born in Hawaii and I can run for president soon. <laughs> That's interesting. What do you, well, let's just talk about the, the left for a moment since sure. you just raised identity politics. Right. Um, uh, you heard the episode that with Sam Harris and, um, and Hannibal Burris that was about four or five episodes ago I, of my I, show, right? I did a sad truth clip on that. You failed to oh. mention that I have a YouTube channel that's gotten, by the way, that clip where I went, when I critiqued your interaction that you just spoke of, uh-huh. It's gotten quite a bit of views, so thank you. Oh, for... okay, good. No sweat. I'll go back and watch it. I feel I feel embarrassed that I didn't know that you've no done worries. that. I'll, no I'll, 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 I'll watch it. Um, so the the question there is, uh, like, sometimes I'll feel like you go too far in in assuming that the only people who can who can. So the the criticism of Hannibal Burris's position for those who haven't heard that episode, but you really should because it's an interesting episode, is that he's basically saying. Sam Sam Harris couldn't possibly understand what it's like to be a black person in America. And, and these sort of daily indignities of being African-American in America give black Americans an understanding of the of the crisis of the racial crisis in a way that no one that no amount of studying data is going to give you. Right. And Sam Harris is pushing back on that and saying, yeah, but the only way that we're ever going to find common ground with each other is is by understanding what the facts actually are. It's it's no use just rioting every time a black person gets shot unless we know whether or not black people are getting shot disproportionately than white people. You know, he makes the point that 6% of the American population are are African-American males, but they are 40% of homicide victims uh, and 50% of homicide uh, uh, perpetrators, you know. So what kind of level of greater interaction would you expect between police officers and the black community? And, and when he starts talking about that data as a middle-aged white guy, Hannibal Burris just it, it finds that so offensive because it's so divorced from the lived experience right. of Hannibal's life living, growing up as a poor kid in Chicago. Right. And I get a little bit torn because I know that you're sort of a hero of people who... Um, who find that to be sort of toxic bullshit. Right. But on the other hand, I also think we do have to recognize that a person's lived experience actually does make a difference. Like you'll sometimes tweet mockingly like there's no, I can't have an, a doctor can't have an opinion about, you know, a woman's pregnancy because he's never been pregnant. <laughs> that's irrelevant. But <laughs> that's right. snarky, but it doesn't really land the, it doesn't so, really land. So let me weigh in. Let me weigh in. Uh, both Hannibal and Sam are correct. And that depends on what is the purpose of whatever it is that they are spewing. So if Hannibal is on a show where he's talking about, let me share with you in the same way that we talk, you know, why do I have, why do I keep a dear diary? Because I'd like to bear witness to my lived experience in this case, in the privacy of my diary. So if the purpose of Hannibal Burris to get on your show is to share the personal experiences that he has had Uh, which you haven't and which Sam hasn't, uh, then by all means, let us learn from that and please testify, right? On the other hand, if we're having a conversation about, well, is there an endemic systemic problem of, you know, uh, racism amongst uh, cops whereby they go around uh, with volition to shoot unarmed uh, black men? Well, then in this case, we actually have to turn to this little thing known as epidemiology 
and this other little thing known as statistics. And that allows us to then establish whether it is worthwhile for us to collectively tackle this endemic problem or whether that problem doesn't exist. So it's not that Han Hannibal uh, Burris is incorrect and Sam is right or the other way around. It's, it depends what the purpose of that interaction is. So for example, if you ask me, please share your experiences regarding uh, Jew hatred in Lebanon growing up when you tried, when you escaped execution, I can share that with you. But the reality is that doesn't necessarily allow me to proclaim greater knowledge about the dynamics of war more than you if you have stats. So, so again, it, both are fine. The problem with Hannibal is that he was arguing that here is a white middle-aged guy spewing this intel faux intellectual stats. That's frankly offensive to me, right? The truth is not racist, right? So mm -hmm. Hannibal is right to talk about his lived experiences. Sam is right to share this little thing known as scientific facts. Yeah, and part of my concern is that, and I, I, I suspect this is part of your concern, that the discourse, that modern discourse, especially in the United, the United States, is devolving towards a bias towards personal experience. Exactly. So, so, so that lived experience become lived experience actually starts trumping data and, and facts, and in, in a way that, uh, funny that I just subconsciously used the word trump because you know <laughs> I think it trumps it in a way that has fueled Trump in some ways, right? right? That, that part of the part of the I think of the Trump movement as as people basically throwing shit at the wall to try to get noticed and to try to upend the, a system that they feel hasn't served them. Right. And part of the way in which it hasn't served them is that they feel like there's no way that they can address issues of immigration, there's no way that they can address issues of, of very real issues, of shifting demographics, of shifting culture. I mean, I was posting on Facebook th just this morning with some, uh, a friend of mine who's a, a very senior journalist in, in the UK uh, talking about Brexit. And he was sort of saying, well, you know, people voted for for Brexit and they're supporting Trump because of the hollowing out of the middle class and wage stagnation and rising income inequality. And I was sort of saying, you know what, a lot of them say that they're voting for Trump because they want to build a wall and they don't like there being so many Mexicans here and they think we should have fewer Muslims in America. Now, you can rationalize that away and say, well, they're just saying that they believe that because in actual fact, the you know NAFTA and the, and the, the decline of the manufacturing base and so on, but in some ways, I feel like there are, there are concerns that we as elite liberal journalists, I don't include you in that <laughs> category necessarily, but my cohort of people, there are concerns that we think it's valid for people to have, and there are concerns that, are, that we regard as being too crass or tawdry or nativist for people to have. So when people say that it's immigration, we flip it and say, Oh, it can't actually be immigration. It's got to be like the decline of the white m working class in, ma in manufacturing cities. I think we, we would be better served to take them at face value and say, listen, I want to live in a country that has very high levels of immigration that is multi-ethnic and cosmopolitan because that's the kind of person that I am. There are other people who want to live in a parochial, homogenous, culturally and ethnically uh, coherent place like the one they grew up in. And that is a legitimate difference of opinion. And no amount of me wagging my finger at them and saying, well, actually, you're mistaken. What you really resent is the decline of the manufacturing base is going to change that. But I don't think that, uh, I mean, I don't know what the percentage would be, but I don't think that many of the people who are exhibiting concern over the somewhat open border immigration policy, and certainly more in Europe than in the United States, but boy, are we trying to catch up to the mistakes of, the, of Europe. Uh, I don't think all of them, uh, they're doing it because they're nativists and all the other politically correct buzzwords that you're using. No disrespect. Uh, I think a lot of them, uh, that train has sailed, right? I mean, the reality is we, the United States is not a homogenized, unicultural, uniskin colored society. And so to try to maintain that would be trying to catch a train that left 19 days ago. Uh, I think most people are waking up to the reality that not all immigrants come with equally compatible values with those in which you and I and our children would like to grow up in. And there is absolutely nothing distasteful about making that statement. As a matter of fact, to deny that reality is grotesque, is barbaric, is distasteful. People come in a, a large number of differences. Some are taller, some are shorter, some have green eyes, some have blue eyes, some have values which they grew up with that are perfectly compatible with Western values, others don't. 
it is perfectly reasonable for people in the West to decide that those who come with values that are incompatible to ours uh, are not welcome here. Now, shed those values, give up those values, join our common brotherhood, and hey, everybody is welcome. There's nothing racist about that. There's nothing bigoted about that. It's called having a brain that understands uh, the instinct for survival. The, the problem, Gad, is, and I don't disagree with that, the problem is that values are malleable in a way that height or eye color isn't, right? So th I feel like this is people who are concerned, you know, I'm not one of these lefties who says, oh, no Muslim, no terrorists are Muslims because Islam is by definition a religion of peace, therefore right. jihadis aren't, you know, aren't right. Muslims or something, or that, you know, that we need to be completely unconcerned about the right. homophobia and misogyny of, uh, of Orthodox Muslims. Um, but I do think that the interplay between the way that migrant communities get absorbed by uh, liberal democracies is worth being aware of when we think about how people change over time. Sure. And the rejection specifically of Muslims or Mexicans on the, on the grounds, uh, on the basis of what they might believe at the instant that they're applying for their immigration status can ignore the way that those beliefs are likely to modify and be shaped and unfold. And, the re and we have historical reasons for believing that they will unfold over not only the course of that migrant's life, but more importantly, their children's life and their grandchildren's life. But incidentally, I mean, the, the way they might uh, change is not in the way that you're, you seem to be uh, implying. The, the, the second and third generation could actually be more orthodox and more extremist than their... Uh, they could be, so but they don't tend to be. It could be. I mean, I mean, is that true at the empirical level? Because I know that in England, apparently, uh, I think some studies have been done, I, I hope I'm not misspeaking, where they've shown that on average, the two generations, so the current generation, are substantially more orthodox in their views. And I'm speaking here about uh, Muslim immigrants uh, than those who came, say, in the 60s and 70s. Have you have you heard of th those types of findings? I haven't, I haven't heard those about those studies. I, I, it doesn't sound implausible to me that given high rates of, of unemployment and sort of cultural dislocation and disaffection that you that them that maybe in the UK and probably certainly in places like the suburbs of Paris and Brussels that you could find second or third gen generation Muslims with high levels of disaffection oh. who who go to to the dark side. But I, I'm I'm almost certain that in the here in the United States, uh, second and third generation Muslims are better integrated than their first generation parents. Can I can I challenge you a bit on something that you just said here? Yeah, uh, you, you had the instinct to look for external forces, right? It, it could be because of unemployment. It could be because we're not being nice to them. It could be because of call. It could be uh, now this is not you saying it, but let me offer some other ones. It could be because of beard bullying. It could be because lack of art exposure. It could be because of climate change. Your 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 man Bill Nye on your show, which I spent the past year trashing him. Uh, made a, oh, that's what you were referring to. Yeah, you tweeted about that. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Now, oh, now, have, really? Have, really? It wasn't obvious what that uh, reference was to work? Oh, I've interviewed Bill a bunch of times, and so I, was, I wasn't oh, clear I about exactly my, what My it was. apologies for being opaque then. No, that's all right. I had, so I had him on HuffPost Live, and one of the things that he was talking about, because also, you got to remember, on HuffPost Live, we would do these half-hour conversations or more, and then they would clip, you know, two minutes out of it and ah, put a gotcha. splashy headline gotcha. on it. So it's probably like, so Bill that, Live that's... blames terrorism, you know, blames, <laughs> blames terrorism on climate change or something because that's going to get the clicks. Right. So, so he, he, made the ref, he made a point that there were food shortages across the Middle East, which were partly contributing factors to, to instability in the Middle East, which could cause terrorism. Yeah. In Paris, he was specifically <laughs> linked to the Paris okay. attack. Anyways, but th that notwithstanding, so your instinct, uh, probably because you want to be a decent guy, a tolerant guy, a guy who doesn't truly want to believe that there could be a book that contains some content that is really, really dangerous. You look for external forces outside of that book, right? So it must be because of lack of unemployment. It must be because they're not well integrated. It could be because they're not polit participating politically. Or how about it's because there is a religious awakening in them whereby they start taking the contents of their books very seriously and literally, right? Occam's razor. But why does the awakening happen, Gad? Well, I mean, it happens for all sorts of reasons. I mean, we can discuss why it right. happens. So that's all, well, that, well, that's what I'm doing. I'm discussing those reasons. I mean, I think, I think you're slightly barking up the wrong tree in, insofar as I would never deny that the, you know, I, I'm with Sam Harris on the question of, like, we don't need to try to figure out terribly, terribly much why people in Syria who are, mem who are enthusiastic members of ISIS are enthusiastic members of ISIS. I mean, I don't think it's because of 
uh, I don't think it's reducible to U.S. foreign policy or right. like the occupation of Palestine or something. I mean, you're right. They believe the things they believe because they actually believe in the book that they that they that they read. That to me is uh, is a, a necessary but not sufficient explanation for all forms of jihadi terrorism, right? So I don't think that it is pandering to Islamists to to make the link that I just made, which is that. Let's. Tr there has to be some reason why, for example, we don't see as much homegrown Muslim terrorism in the United States as we do, for example, in France. Uh, because, the the because the population of the uh, people who adhere to that book hasn't reached the sufficiently large enough critical mass right. for and those that, things to happen. And that difference must have reasons, and those reasons are the ones that I'm interrogating that you seem to be dismissing. So, look, think of it this way. Uh, do you think it's logical that if I have poor educational opportunities or I am unemployed or I'm not financially secure that I decide, you know what, here's a nice thing to do. Let me go to Raqqa and throw off some murtad off uh, uh, a, a building. That seems to be very, very clear the link there. Uh, incidentally, by the way, there have been empirical studies that have shown that terrorists, the link between terrorism and poverty doesn't exist, right? I mean, that's that's a true. false thing. There's a, so, so in other words, I think it comes, this comes from a very noble instinct, which is we don't wish to believe that people actually do things because they are religiously motivated. I mean, yes, maybe religion has something to do with it, but there must have been a catalyst that pushed them into this religious fervor. Uh, no, there is no rational, sane explanation for why, if you start taking the contents of the Quran more seriously, what might trigger that is because you didn't get the job that you wished. I mean, I know tons of my students who finish their MBAs and don't end up getting a good job. They don't throw off gays from Raqqa. Okay. Of course. I mean, I, I know lots of smokers who live to 100 years old as well, but we, we you know, we you need to look at, this comes back to data, right? And statistics. And data is racist. Data and is anec racist. And, and anecdote is not data. I mean, I'd say a couple of things about that. Um, yeah. Y yeah, you're totally right. There is no logical reason why, why any set of conditions would lead someone to behave like a psychopath. That doesn't mean that there aren't reasons why people behave like psychopaths or why they get tipped over from uh, sort of paying lip service to their Islam, to taking it so seriously that they end up, you know, moving, moving to Raqqa. And if there are epidemiological differences between the level of violent extremism that you see among different cohorts of Muslims, I think it's worth asking why. And, and if we see that in the banlieue of Paris, there are high levels of radicalized young people who are going to, to Syria, and those people are coming from communities with astronomically high youth unemployment uh, and, from a, and in a country where, to be frank, there's been quite a lot of racism towards Muslims versus their cohorts in the United States who have better opportunities, who on average earn more than the average non-Muslim American does and who are welcomed into a country that uh, accepts you more or less if you, if you pledge allegiance to the nation rather than to any particular ethnicity, language, uh, religion or race. Then I, I think that's worth. I think that might that may play play into it. Does that mean that every single person who endures the same uh, the same ignominy as as young Muslims in the sub in the poor suburbs of Paris is gonna is gonna become a jihadist? Absolutely not. But does it mean that we should fail to interrogate any reason other than simply saying only the Quran is to blame? Also, probably not. Yeah, look, the, it, the Quran doesn't exist in a vacuum. That's basically all you're saying, right? Yeah, it, basically. It doesn't yeah. exist in a parallel universe where nothing other than the Quran exists. And of course, I will concede that point. But ultimately, by engaging in this type of let's look for catalysts and causal reasons and other reasons, we are ultimately creating an opaque, opaque vision of what the reality is. It really is quite simple. Uh, if I choose to eat pig, or pork, uh, and I'm Jewish, That's and then I want to know whether pork consumption is allowed, it's not by looking at Gatsad that you establish that, it's by looking at what the, the kosher laws of Judaism say, right? And therefore, I look to those texts in, in Judaism to establish whether pork consumption is allowed or not. So anybody who wishes to ultimately understand what motivates those jihadis has to commit themselves to at least understanding the contents of the Quran, of the Hadith, and of the Sirah.
of Muhammad. And once you do that, then you could come to your own conclusion. Maybe my reading of those texts is completely false and it's nothing but love and companionship. Then you can teach me that. But the problem is a lot of the things that delegitimize people when they engage in that exercise, I pass them because Arabic is my mother tongue because I did grow up in the Middle East. Uh, the only thing is I'm not one of the faithful companions of Muhammad, so maybe I don't understand the nuances of old classic Quranic Arabic. So it sounds like I'm being facetious and, and ironic, but I'm not. There, there are constant strategies to give Islam uh, a bit of you know, leeway. There is no reason for that, right? I mean, I criticize idiotic Jewish practices, even though, by the way, of course, all religions don't lead to the same downstream effects, right? Uh, yesterday, I was mocking some very specific rules. You know, you, when you're drinking uh, wine, wine from a glass during Kiddush, a Jewish thing, it has to be no less than 3.3 ounces. And you light the candle when it's 18 minutes. And I made the comment, you know, it seems like the Lord of the universe is really concerned about these very, very trivial minutiae, <laughs> right? Now, when I make that statement, right, very few people will come back to me and say, what an anti-Semitic Jew hater this guy is, right? Because I am rightfully criticizing some lunacy, or at least I have the right to criticize that lunacy. Why is it that you and I can't engage in the exact same mocking, ridiculing, criticizing of all religions. And the reality is, so going back to the Trump issue, the left is a lot more prone to feel uncomfortable in engaging in that criticism. And the correct position, look, Trump's no, no Muslims can get in is insane. I mean, that is, that is a crazy position to take, precisely because most Muslims are absolutely lovely and don't want to engage in any of this. But on the other hand, Hillary Clinton not being able to say, if I ask Hillary Clinton, hey, ever heard of Islam? She'll say, never heard of that. Sorry. Don't know what that is. I literally have no... Well, she'll, she'll say, I, I, I have heard of it. It's the most peaceful religion peaceful, on earth right. and no Muslim ever does anything wrong. Exactly. So yeah. somewhere again between these two outlandish positions, you and I lie. And that's what we have to be supporting. That yes. Type of Yes, I mean, I, compl I completely agree. That's, what, that's really what gets to the nub of the, of the, the problem here. My, my concern is that, our, that because people, because the social justice brigade are so ridiculous and because this, you know, this denial, I mean, you know, I have said many times, the day after the Charlie Hebdo attacks, Howard Dean was on MSNBC, on Morning Joe, on Joe Scarborough's show, saying that the attackers, quote, are about as Muslim as I am. <laughs> He said, yeah, right? I now, now that. that that kind of rhetoric is just genuinely toxic. Is just uh, it, and it, imagine you're a low information voter. Imagine you imagine you imagine you live in Lyon in the south of France, and you don't know a lot about the Quran. You're just trying to live your life, and you've seen what happened in Paris, and you've seen a maniac drive a bus in Nice and mow down innocent women and children and and, and holiday makers. You know what happened on 9-11. You know that every time a synagogue gets shot up, it, or in every one of these scenarios, it's someone screaming Allahu Akbar. But all of the mainstream politicians are saying Islam is a religion of peace. There is no problem here. All of the imams are saying we shouldn't even have to uh, apologize this or interrogate it because uh, these people aren't true Muslims. Of course, if Marine Le Pen from the Front National steps up or Donald Trump steps up or anyone and says, cut the bullshit, of course this is a Muslim problem, then you're going to vote for them. You're at least going to be tempted to. And this is why I completely agree with you that we've sort of abrogated our responsibility on the left to have a bullshit-free conversation about this and say, most Muslims are peaceful. There are 1.6 billion of them. We have to find a way to ally ourselves with them. It's, it's not us against them. It's some of us and some of them against some of them and some of us, right? It's, it's us against extremists. But... Islam is undergoing a fucking civil war and it is fracturing at the seams and we have to acknowledge and reconcile ourselves to that and we have to kind of make the Muslim community accountable for reconciling itself to the fact that there is this rift at its fringe. doesn't mean all Muslims, right? And, and our inability to do that has been, I think, one of the real calamities of the past, I guess, five or six years since ISIS began. Uh, I pretty much agree with everything you said. Uh, let me just maybe uh, put a little asterisk to one word you used, fringe. Uh, it is true that they're the fringe in that those who actively, uh, behaviorally, overtly 
manifest the contents of the Quran or the, the, the ugly parts of the Quran are that fringe mi uh, minority. So that is true. On the other hand, if you're saying, is that position that is compelling them to act this way some fringe element within the Quran or some misunderstood or mistranslated or mis uh, interpreted then no it's not fringe in other words it's not as though they are taking the one violent uh, sentence in the Quran and somehow twisting it into a misunderstanding because they're Pakistani and they don't understand classical Quranic Arabic and therefore that's why they're thinking that uh, caress, caress, caress really means kill, 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 but it's all due to a misunderstanding, right? Uh, the reality is if you do a content analysis of those texts, as has Bill Warner, who has been on my show, uh, you'll find that, I mean, you could scientifically, going back to the idea of stats that we were talking at the start of the show, we don't have to debate whether a particular text is violent or not. We could use the tools of science, in this case it's called content analysis, to determine how often are there invocations of brotherly love, how often are there invocations to kill those who are not like you, and we could definitively quantify that and come up with a solution. Well, when you do that exercise, it doesn't come out that it's all full of let's caress each other and give each other massages. It seems like there's a lot, a lot of nasty positions towards the other. Well, that's that's why, as an atheist, I thank God every day that uh, that we don't pay Sorry, much attention thank, to. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, uh, I thank God every day that uh, that we that we don't pay much attention to all the bullshit in our holy books. I mean, you know, I I was bar mitzvahed, so uh, I know my my uh, my my. You're an evil <laughs> juice. I'm another. I'm, look, my my grandparents. Yeah, my grandparents were Holocaust survivors who came to Australia as uh, as refugees, uh, and. You know, the idea, if you open up the Old Testament, and now I'm not, make, again, making a, a kind of phony moral equivalence between Islam and other religions, but there is a shit ton of shit in all of these old mystical um, piles of nonsense. Which and no so, one takes seriously. No which one. No one, which almost no one takes yeah. seriously. And so when I, talk about the, when I talk about the fringe of Islam, uh, I'm talking about the, the, the proportion of the Muslim population that either uses or enables the use of violence to achieve its Islamist goals, right? And there's, some, there's an interesting point that Majid Nawaz raises. Most, most of my listeners and yours, I think, will know Majid. He sure. runs the Quilliam Foundation in the UK. He's a former uh, Islamist extremist who, who now has devoted his life to, um, to fighting Muslim extremism and to providing a counter-narrative to that. And he makes an interesting point about distinguishing between conservative Muslims and radical jihadis. Because when you talk about how kind of silly and divisive much of the Quran and the Hadiths are, um, the people who actually believe them the most and who would be able to recite chapter and verse all of the, the holy Islamic texts are actually mostly conservative, very conservative Muslims who we would disagree with a lot about their attitudes towards gays and women and modernity, but who mostly want to keep a low profile and don't support um, terrorism. When they're the, in the minority. When they uh, are in the minority. There are more of them than there are of terrorists. Like the the majority of Muslims are just, you know, they're Muslims the way that my grandmother was a Catholic. I mean, you know, this or or my other grandmother was a Jew. Um, it's sort of a, a just an ethnic label for them. Sure. You know, when you actually look at the people who are who are blowing themselves up and machine gunning people in Parisian concert halls, uh, these are not people who are who are deeply sort of inculcated with the with, with faith. They're, they're, so we often tend to think, I think, that the the problem of Islam is a problem of um, deeply religious, misogynistic, sexist people who have a violent desire to uh, attack infidels. That's actually two groups of people normally. The ones with the violent desire to attack infidels are actually usually a, a, a different cohort than the deeply fundamentalist people who we should also worry about when it comes to immigration, as you said earlier, because they're also, yeah, if 20% if of the population of the United States was suddenly people who don't think that women should be allowed to drive, then even if they didn't want to blow anything up, that'd be a fucking problem. Yeah. And, yeah, and, so that, and I'm really glad that you mentioned this last point because I often precisely talk about this when I discuss immigration issues. So for example, in Canada, uh, with the uh, incoming uh, uh, Justin Castrato in chief Trudeau, also known as Justin Hairboy Trudeau, uh, <laughs> he's trying to repeat uh, the mistakes of Europe uh, by bringing in tens of series. Now listen, I'm a guy who escaped Lebanon. So if anybody is sympathetic 
to people. And let's talk about Hannibal Burris's strategy of using lived experience. No one's lived experience is more clearly relevant to discuss this issue than someone who escaped execution in Lebanon. So I'm incredibly sympathetic on a human level to anyone who is trying to flee, uh, you know, war and strife and hatred. So I'll concede that. Of course, we want to let people in. The problem is that we don't have a magical machine that allows us to put people in and see what's in their hearts and minds. And what's in their hearts and minds is not simply, I'd like to blow up and behead people. It's precisely those values, which may not be violent, but are perfectly antithetical to Western values. And that when you have enough of those people that hold those values, they irrevocably change the character of a society. That's really the fundamental issue. The reality is that out of 25,000 Syrians coming in, yes, a few are going to be ISIS members, and yes, we should try to stop them. But that's frankly, from a long window perspective, those are not the guys that I'm worried about. I'm worried about them today when I go to my campus that they don't blow me up. But in terms of my grand, great-grandchildren, I worry about the fact that by letting in a certain number of people that will change the fabric of our society, we can never turn back the tide. See, uh, I, I actually worry about, I do worry about that, Gad, yeah. but I actually worry about that less okay. than I worry about the, um, the possibility of turning America and all Western countries, well, Europe doesn't really have a choice, so let's excuse that because people can just wander across land from, <laughs> from Syria into Germany, right? But... I worry about create about playing into ISIS's narrative of the world being split between infidels and good Muslims, and that the only way to be a good Muslim is to be a conservative fundamentalist and potentially violent Muslim. So I I feel like in these debates I'm sort of the one betting on Western civilization, and you're the one betting against it in terms of betting on the on the fragility of our ability to win over the people who are coming in. I think in the 21st century the best antidote to Muslim fundamentalism is going to be a large, thriving, moderate Muslim community in places like North America and Australia that can speak to the world's Muslims and say, see, these places are not anti-Muslim. We have great lives here. We are Muslim Americans and America is not the great Satan. Rather than America being a fortress America, which is up, proudly upholding its Christian principles and plays into a, a narrative that, that extremists have that it's, that it's fundamentally antithetical and their choice is either jihad or, or nothing. Ah, the optimism of youth. <laughs> uh, well, hey, I've got Thomas Paine on my side. I've got, <laughs> I've got Spinoza on my side. I've got, I've got right. Madison and uh, Washington on my side. Look, the reality is that uh, I think that if the, the, the confidence of the West were where it needs to be, then I think your argument might might actually uh, have you know be, be more veridical in that ultimately you would have the testicular fortitude at the at the at the aggregate level to defend your Western values if they were challenged. I think the problem is where I might see your position as maybe slightly too optimistic is that, and I've analogized this and I'll repeat it. Uh, there is a, a a species called the spider wasp, which uh, comes. Have you have you seen my clip on this? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me just let me yeah. just repeat it very quickly. Where it goes after this much much larger spider and it stings it and it stings in such a way that the spider becomes a a basically a, a zombie that it can now take into its burrow and it can have its children, its offspring eating it in vivo. The spider is alive and yet it has been parasitized. And I compare political correctness and the thought police and the postmodernism and cultural relativism and all that confluence of parasitizing factors in the West to exactly the spider's sting. What, I'm, what I mean by that is that the West seems to have lost its ability to ultimately have the natural instinct to defend its values. And that's the problem. And what happens is once we go down the burrow, to continue with the analogy, far enough, it is impossible to return because the demographic realities become too difficult to overturn. So I hope to be on your side and I hope that your explanation is correct and your optimistic view. But at least I find that it is my job to warn people that if what you're betting on doesn't happen, then I'm going to have to relive what I lived in Lebanon. Do you find that in Canada as much as in the States? Uh, Canada is worse than the States, but not as bad as Europe. So we're right in the middle uh, in terms of uh, this 
grand experiment with are you talking just about islam there because when i think about social justice the whole social yeah. justice warrior movement when i think about the 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 manner in which you know i'll tweet something that might have been a little bit silly or could be misinterpreted as being racist or something but it but obviously comes from a good place if you know anything about me and if you gave even the most cursory glance to the rest of my work right and then all of a sudden 40,000 hate tweets later you know we're off to the races uh then i think I find that to be quite a uniquely American thing. I find that there's, that there's a strain of extreme Puritanism in America that can find its expression through Christian evangelism, through gun rights. Through it, There's just a, an absolutism in America that can treat things as more black and white. And I find that in Australia, and I don't know your, your nation of Canada well enough, but I sort of think of it mentally in the same basket as Australia. Aussies and Canadians and New Zealanders can be sort of annoyingly fluffy when it comes to things like Islam because they don't really want to take a stance. But the precise fact that they don't want to take a stance about anything is actually quite refreshing when it comes to things like using the correct transgender pronoun or never saying the word nigger in conversation, even if you're just talking about it in passing or something like that. And that America is actually more hostile and more of a pressure cooker where the moment you trip some tripwire, all of a sudden that transgression means that you need to be ruined and you're going to be destroyed. And so, I, yeah, I don't know whether you have any books about yeah, those I mean, that's, trans that's, extremism. Yeah, so there, there is an expression that says that when the United States sneezes, Canada eventually catches a cold, right? And so I think when it comes to the SJW, the social justice warrior stuff, I think that the mechanism is exactly that. And so it, it probably corresponds to what you're saying. I think it's probably stronger in the United States. Uh, and certainly, if I can speak about sort of the environment that I'm most familiar with on campuses, uh, it hasn't fully manifested itself in the lunatic ways that it has at some of the universities in the United States, but it is certainly making its way. And so, for example, there is a recent case. There's a gentleman by the name of Jordan Peterson, who's a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto, who actually just reached out to me, uh, and he's going to be on my show next week. Uh, he got into all sorts of hot trouble this re very recently because he refused to uh, acquiesce to the demands of students who wish to be addressed using their own, you know, idiosyncratic uh, terms and so on. Uh, but I had thought... You mean like gender, gender neutral gender, gender pronouns? Exactly, right? Yeah, Z right. and their yeah, yeah. Z yeah. and whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, now, I had documented this uh, phenomenon two years ago. I had given a talk at Wellesley College, which is sort of the, the maybe the mecca of this kind of stuff because it's an all-girls... Uh, uh, very posh, prestigious, very expensive school to go to outside of Boston, right? So people who truly have not suffered anything, but who wish to uh, tie into the victimology ethos. And so they walk around very angry to fight all sorts of issues. And I had given a talk about the thought police at Wellesley that had gone actually quite well. Nobody had uh, whistled at me and throw, thrown tomato at me. And then at the end of the talk, I had stayed back to chat with a lot of students. And one student was quite upset or she, she, very polite, but she didn't quite understand why it was strange that I would think it strange that I wouldn't poll students at the start of class uh, to find out what their own individual gender identities would be so that I could mark it and say, oh, Josh, okay, you look like a man, but you're a girl. So, so, you, so okay, you're a she, got it. Uh, so you're Mrs. Uh, I, I thought, do you really think that this is the natural optimal way for society to manifest itself. And then I used an extreme example to prove my point. I said, so if you walk into a gynecologist's office, even though by definition, the people who are walking in are walking in precisely because they recognize that biologically they're women, should the receptionist not uh, assume that they are all women and ask them first their gender identity? So that, that kind of destabilized her. She said, well, no, but that seems like an extreme example. I said, but you don't think that if you're in a hallway of 200 students, it would seem extreme for me to sit there and try to pull everybody's situationally different gender identity? Uh, but, you know, she couldn't. She thought, but that's the nice thing to do. That's the empathetic. And my position is, look, if there's an individual student who is going through the very real difficulties of gender identity disorder, they could come to me. And as any reasonable person, I will listen to their concern. And on an idiosyncratic level, I will address it. The problem comes when it becomes a machine gun, all pervasive, mm. all encompassing, mm. right? So, so to answer your question in a long-winded way, I think it's more of a phenomenon in the United States. But boy, is it coming to Canada fast. Yeah, and the other thing that, 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 what you just, that your anecdote just reminded me of is the, the worrying thing is not that, that, these trans, that these supposed transgressions, if that's what you regard them as, are being identified, right? I mean, I think it's, it's useful for us all to have 
an opening of our minds to experiences that we have no you know common ground with i think i've evolved a lot in the past few years on trans issues i mean i would have easily made just the most casually transphobic joke 5 years ago and nowadays i i am aware in a useful way that this is a thing that people experience that people are going through and i try to be tactful about it where the problem comes in is when there is punishment for the transgression right when when it becomes so a friend of a friend of mine i just heard about this yesterday is a comic in portland and he does a nude comedy show where he's completely nude now he's a korean american guy uh i believe or japanese american and he's doing a nude comedy show in front of a bunch of hipsters and someone heckled him from the front row and he uh responded to to her and called and said out like check out check out this lady she said i'm not a lady asshole i'm trans i'm a trans man and he was fired from the show and invited never to come back to the <laughs> now he's a korean american guy doing a naked stand up routine in an edgy city like portland i mean this is where you just get i mean that makes me want to vote for trump <laughs> 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 you know, like well, that's a problem. Uh, well, ex um, exactly. So, so I mean, one of the things that I try to do, uh, you know, of course, I'm I'm very busy in my scientific career. But the reason why I feel compelled to weigh in on all these issues because I feel that I have, however small a voice I have, to weigh in on these issues. So I accept uh, the lovely, gracious invitation uh, of Josh to come on a show precisely because we need to swing that pendulum. I mean, we need to find that happy medium precisely in the way that you described it right you're now more sensitive to transphobic issues and that's a great thing but take it too far and it becomes mm. lunacy yes yeah, don't fire me from a stand-up club in Poland, exactly. especially when i'm naked uh now do you feel well just on i just want to go back to the question briefly of uh of the ability of immigrant populations to absorb the liberal values of sure. of host countries when my grandparents, when my poor, penniless, uh, destitute, uneducated Jewish, Polish grandparents came to Australia. But if they're white, they were still privileged. <laughs> well. <laughs> and if they escaped the Holocaust, it doesn't matter. If we classify them as white, they were privileged. Sorry, that's the way it works. That's the way it apparently works. Yeah. But, at the, but it didn't work that way at the time, did it? I mean, right. there, were, there, were, there were legitimate concerns about whether or not such people would ever be able to learn the values of the Enlightenment. They were not Enlightenment people. They were Polish seamstresses. Yeah. Uh, your, you know, your family coming, presumably you came out of the Lebanese Civil War, right. I'm assuming. Yes. Uh, you know, one of the most calamitous uh, experiences in the Middle East of the, of the 1980s. And there, any onlooker would have good reason to question whether or not the people who were participated in that, who were participating in that, even if they were victims, would ever be capable of becoming, a, a, you know, good, upstanding citizens. This was, this, I mean, every wave of migrants, the local population has had good reason to suspect their ability to embrace liberal values. Do you not think that there's a chance that we're making a similar mistake with Muslims today? Uh, if, if stated in the grand blanket statement and how Trump has intimated that position, absolutely we're making a mistake. If we use the more nuanced recognition that not all immigrants or prospective immigrants are as likely to have incompatibility issues, then I think it's perfectly fair to be more concerned about one group than another. So let's yeah. take let's take yeah. it right. Let's take it. Mm -hmm. I, I've used the following term: cultural homophily. Right, uh, homophily is to be attracted. Things that are attracted are those that are similar to one another. Right. So, for example, assortative mating is where we choose somebody to mate with precisely because they share our values, our beliefs. And there's a lot of research that shows that on average, successful mating relationships are those that adhere to birds of a feather flock together, right? So now let's extend this argument, this assortative argument at the cultural level, right? I mean, it doesn't take Einstein to recognize that if you take two cultures and put them next to each other, the more similar they are to each other, the more they don't have conflicting worldviews, more defining ethos that is different from one another, the more they're likely to mesh. Therefore, Estonians and Lithuanians, even though they come from different uh, cultures, they speak different languages, they might eat slightly different foods, are more likely to integrate with one another than Estonians and Yemenites. Now, it really doesn't take a Nobel Prize to get that. So therefore, if we concede that point, we recognize that even though your grandparents and, and my family and countless other immigrants might, we might have been fearful that they might not integrate, that fear doesn't come in equal shape.
You understand what I'm saying? So therefore, be- yeah. But I also think that my my Polish Jewish penniless refugee camp parents were at least as different from your average uh, white English derived Sydney cider or Melbourneian as a Muslim who comes to New York and settles in a Muslim community. Yes, yes and no. It, it depends on what is the metric that we use to define that distance, right? So, for yeah. example, if we use the metric of height, well, then maybe... No, no, but I mean, that's how you explain these things, right? If we use... Language, religion, knowledge of the English literary canon, uh, you know, experience living in assimilated environments, uh, geography of how far away they grew up. I mean, pick uh, your yardstick. Should, should Jews be killed and not exist? Should gays be tolerated <laughs> to exist? Should clitorises exist or not? Uh, that we should not have people who believe who disagree with those statements. Exactly. In the so again, yeah. differences amongst people come in different sizes, shapes, and form. When it comes to a mass experiment of let's let in one million people to Germany, then it is perfectly reasonable and not in the least bit bigoted to say, "Hey, these one million people." What is the likelihood of them integrating as compared to if we let in one million Danes? Mm. And the reality is it's not equal probability that they will both integrate. And therefore, the native German people have every right to say, so is this a good idea or not? Now, forget about Islam. How about just integrating them economically, socially, educationally? So let's take Islam out of the, out of the way, right? I am already taxed right now off the charts, Right. If you now let in tons and tons of people so that you increase the burden on me, do I have a right to say whether I have the right, whether I have the duty to support everybody around the world or whether I should be more close minded and where my tax up? So that all these issues can be raised in a polite, proper way without it being feather and tarred as a racist, nativist bigoted position, correct? To, to, yes, to, uh, two things about that. One, I would definitely cleave off. Uh, Germany's experience from those of countries that have the good fortune to be surrounded by water, like Canada, the United States, and Australia and New Zealand, right? I mean, yeah, I think the the concerns of having a million people just sort of wander across the border and and be processed in in your country are are different from ones in which I don't. I think a lot of North Americans don't understand just how rigorous the refugee uh, vetting process is here. I mean, it takes years of living in a squalid refugee camp, often in Lebanon or in Jordan or or Turkey or some such place, before you're going to be allowed into the the United States. Um, I would also say that uh, the Danes would assimilate better into Germany than Syrians would, but the food would be much worse. I lived in Denmark for <laughs> for, for a semester, and, and it's all mayonnaise. It's all mayonnaise on hot dogs. Culinary uh, jihad. New term we coined together. Uh, okay, I'll let you go here, but but wrap us up with uh, with your your broad thoughts about the future. I like to get people's sense of whether or not they're generally optimistic or pessimistic about the challenges that we find. Not even specifically on this subject, but on just any subject that could be climate change, that could be anything in the twenty first century. So I guess the, the the broadest thing that I could say is I wish more people simply get engaged and participate in the battle of ideas. We now have all of the tools for each of our voices, from the most loud voice to the most minuscule vote. Uh, voice to contribute to the discussion. Uh, by you being silent, by you being apathetic, you're being complicit in whatever problems we're helping to create. So just participate in any way that you can. And if you do that, I think eventually through you know Darwinian selection, uh, the truth will win out and the, the battle of ideas will go in the right direction. Gad said, the slogan of this show is make debate healthy again. You have helped us make debate healthy again. Thanks Thank for you being so much, sir. Cheers. You got it. Bye. Uh, all right.